I do think I have to say good afternoon rather than good evening at this time of the day, or good evening. Uh, it's my pleasure as president of the Institute to welcome you here. It's, uh, it always gives me great pleasure to see uh, quite a few people all together rather than few people, uh, which happens to happen in some lectures, unfortunately. But introducing the speaker and, and doing, uh, it will be Chris Hodge, uh, and for taking the questions and answers afterwards will be Paul. Therefore, I don't have to do too much, just introducing you here and sitting and enjoying the lecture and taking the questions and answers from my Thank you. Thank you, President. And I thought I had his job. I thought when I got up this morning and came along here that I could spend my day in the council meeting and come along here and sit and listen to a very entertaining lecture and frankly do nothing for that privilege. But no, that wasn't to be. I was stood about to get my cup of tea in that room when Paul said, and what are you saying to introduce these lectures that I'm not introducing them? <laughs> you can see how unpersuasive I am because I'm stood before you now. But the reason I'm here, of course, is that I am actually Gordon Hodge's son. And there are two other members here. Where are they? They're hiding. My sister and my son. Stand up. <laughs> Stand up. <laughs> So there have been two former Gordon Hodge lectures. I did the first one, and Professor Kirill Rozdovensky from St. Petersburg did the second, and this is the third. But just to make it absolutely clear why we have this series of lectures, it's in honor of my father, who was an immensely successful engineer in the context of marine engineering. He had an apprenticeship at Phillips Shipyard in Dartmouth. He joined the RFA during the war and served for a further six years after that. And then he became a teacher, and I understand a very good teacher, and some of you here were taught by him, I believe, and one or two of you will smile when I refer to Gordon's guessing stick. That was his slide rule. It never gave the right answer. <laughs> After teaching, he worked for the IMO as a consultant on maritime training and ended as a very successful career as a consultant to the Norwegian government, again on marine training. Throughout all of that, he was an enthusiastic, committed, and involved member of this institute. For, well, he joined during the war, I believe, and served all the way up through all of the committees. He chaired all the main committees, membership and professional affairs. He was on what was then called the President's Advisory Committee. He served on what was not then called the Executive Board. So he did an awful lot of service. Some of the hardest committees to serve on, actually. The one I was involved in preceding supervisory board is actually quite fun, but the membership is hard, grueling work, and he did that for about 30 years. All of that means he's the only man ever to have the double honor of being both an honorary vice president and an honorary fellow. And hence, we, his family, are immensely proud that he has this lecture series, and this time by Admiral Nick Lambert, who was once the UK National Hydrographer, I believe. And he's taken me off the hook by saying he'll introduce himself, so thank you. <laughs> Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much indeed for coming in to uh, listen to me this evening. Um, it's a great honour as a seaman officer, and uh, I'm allowed to call myself a master mariner, uh, and not, not an engineer, not a scientist, but apparently a, a technologist, uh, to now be in IMRS, which is a, a very impressive institute. And I've just come back from doing some work for IMRS in Singapore this week, or last week. Um, now, I've been around technology all my career. I started life as an ordinary seaman in 1977. I joined the Navy for three years, and, uh, and 36 years and 50 years later, I left, which meant that um, I didn't really achieve anything in the way of selection and maintenance of the AIM. Uh, but I was around technology right from the beginning. I used to write backwards and upside down with China Graph Pencil. Uh, I used to try and develop, uh, try and develop a, a real-time picture from True Motion Radar, and I went in to the first computer systems the Navy had in their operations rooms, and I, and I left uh, with some of the more modern ones uh, that are now up there. 
Uh, now, it's quite daunting as a non-engineer, non-scientist, non-technologist to be talking to all you uh, very clever people. Uh, and it reminds me of the time as I was promoted to captain uh, and sent to work in a NATO job in Europe. I was sent to a place called Brunson in the Netherlands, which is down in the uh, what the Dutch call the Dutch Alps, where the highest point of land is 203 meters. And um, I was invo invited as a naval officer to go into a joint headquarters, which actually was very, very land-centric at the time. It was full of army officers, mostly from America, lots and lots of Americans, lots and lots of German, lots and lots of Dutchmen, and then people like me, uh, but also I was a naval officer and they were all army. So on the night of the first day in this funny army establishment, I thought I'd better find out how all this all works. So I went down to the bar. And there at the bar were three officers, all army officers, an American one, a German one, and a Dutchman. This is a true story, by the way. <laughs> it is, it is. And they were having their beers, and it was about half past five, so it was time for the American to go home to bed. And so he picked up his beer, swigged down the last bit of it, looked at the glass, threw it up in the air, and it went up in a beautiful parabola, got to its apex, he whipped out his pistol, fired around, shattered the glass all over the bar. And the German and the Dutchman said, what on earth did you do that for? And he said, well, hey, you know, we're Americans. We've got such an enormous continent. We've got all the resources we could possibly want. We're incredibly rich. We've got all the sand we need. We can make all the glass we need. We never have to drink out of the same glass twice. And the German and the Dutchman carried on drinking their beer. And the German finished off his beer, looked at the glass, threw it up in the air, got to its apex, whipped out his luger, fired around, glass shattered all over the place. And he said, well, you know, we Germans, uh, we have a very, very rich economy. We don't have a desert, I admit, so, but we are so rich we can import all the sand we could possibly need. Therefore, we can make all the glass we could possibly need. We never have to drink out of the same glass twice. Dutchman by this stage is feeling a bit lonely because small country, not particularly rich economy, no deserts, difficult to get hold of sand. So he finishes off his beer, puts the glass down on the bar, takes out his pistol and shoots the American stone dead. <laughs> and the other two guys said, geez, what did you do that for? He said, well, here in Brunson, we've got so many Americans, you never have to drink with the same one twice. <laughs> so you engineers better watch out. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I, um, I was asked to produce an abstract uh, which I've, which I've um, tried to stick to but actually rather lost my way and it's a fantastic privilege to be allowed to come here and talk about things that interest me uh, and I'd like to try and interest you. Um, I'm going to say quite up front that some of these slides I've plagiarised quite unashamedly from a chap called Rob Lombrow from Fugro who gave an excellent presentation at uh, Ocean Business a few weeks ago and it's so good that I've taken some of his slides and ideas because they match my own um, and I'm also going to try and talk a little bit around positive control of shipping uh, and maybe autonomous shipping. Um, not because I necessarily believe in them, but because I think we need to think about them. And I think that IMRS in a, is in a position to lead some of the debate, and I'll touch on that as I go through. Um, so let's set a context. First of all, you all know this, you know, 95% of the world's trade goes by sea. Just about everybody lives near the sea. Um, I personally believe the future of the global economy relies on the sea. That's where you're going to get your pharmaceuticals from. That's where oil and gas is going to come from. That's where future minerals are going to come from. Um, and we've got a much more of a discussion going around the blue economy, blue tech, blue jobs, and those sorts of things. And I think we are seeing that shift of understanding understanding in political circles to the importance of the maritime. So IMRS sits on the edge of a very interesting stage in the global economy. My final point, and these are my opinions of course, so um, uh, please understand that, is that the maritime world is inherently conservative. And it's fascinating to me that some of the world's most advanced technology can be found in some fantastic ships. There are ships off the southwest coast of Africa which suck up with a massive hoover all sorts of rubble off the seabed and they put it through all sorts of crushes and out of the end of it comes a baked bean can full of diamonds all done at sea. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And yet some of the maritime institutions that are out there are incredibly slow moving and slow in their thinking and they don't want to see change. 
the point of this lecture is to say that I think technological change is going to happen and those institutions are going to be left behind. I don't think IMRS is one of them. So we've got an incredibly rapid pace of technological change. Anybody in here not got a mobile phone? Anybody in here doesn't have a smartphone? I want to see some hands. Quite interesting, quite interesting. Anybody in here doesn't have a laptop or a computer? Computer, anybody doesn't have a computer? Okay, there will be more questions, pay attention. <laughs> I think IMRS represents the user of technology, and I mean this very broadly, engineers, scientists, technologists, and DEC, DEC officers, because I happen to think that DEC officers are becoming much, much more involved in technology. And my personal view is we need to change the type of people we recruit as DEC officers, DEC officers and I think we need to change their training. I also think that technology is being done to the user. How many of you know how to use your mobile phones and your smartphones to 100% of their capability? I reckon I can use it. I'm impressed. I'm going to come and see you afterwards because I, <laughs> I reckon I know about 5% of how to use mine. Uh, and I put in there a little uh, line here about do we understand the modern user? And I'll come on to that. And also this little line in the context of digital navigation. Are we producing a generation of GPS operators or are we producing a generation of digital navigators? And I'll come back to that later on. And the final point is because there are a lot of experienced people in this room, how much of and how do we transfer the incredible experience and knowledge that you've developed, and don't take this the wrong way, over hundreds of years into this new technological and digital environment? And I think that's something that IMRS can help with. So there you go. Technology is both simple and complex. The Singaporean Prime Minister was asked recently what was the single piece of technology that enabled them to transform themselves into an absolutely leading global economy. Any ideas? That's second. Computer. Computer, nope. Internet. Nope. One more offer. Telex. Telex, no, it was air conditioning. Very, very simple. It was air conditioning, which meant that they could put people into air conditioned boxes and then they could use the internet and the computers and they could get this incredible economy kicked off. So it's very, very simple. The picture there is of a, a, a WECDIS, which is a, a warfare electronic display and information system, on the bridge of HMS Iron Duke uh, a couple of years ago, uh, which is now a paperless ship, i.e. there are no paper charts on board these ships as a matter of principle. What do you see about this particular picture? Any tips, anything, on, any observation anybody wants to make? Absolutely right. All the, is there any chance we could turn this light off? I don't know how it's, um, really interesting. All these post-its around the outside. These are because the computer doesn't do what the user needs it to do. So you've got this amazing bit of kit. Don't worry if you can't do it. Oh, okay. You've got this amazing bit of kit, which is a digital navigation system but it doesn't do what the user needs it to do. So the user very proudly told me, and this is not working well, is it? The user very proudly told me how they had designed all these little cribs, which are now issued to ships to go with their digital navigation systems so that they can do the tasks they need to do with those digital systems. So they're complex, but actually they're not doing what the user needs. It's another one of my themes. Now, one of my uh, bete noirs uh, on a ship as an officer watch and a captain, the one single thing technologically you could have done to change my life as engineers and the designers of systems would have been to give me a switch that actually dimmed the lights at night. Because the most important bit of kit the officer watch had was a black China graph pencil and a roll of black pusser's masking tape to blank out all the lights that wouldn't dim so that he or she could see out of the window. And this is another Ectus system in the night lighting condition by some clever designer, which you can see is going to blind the officer the watch. So that's one of the problems. So a very, very simple thing you could do technologically. Actually, the Navy, being the Navy, sorted out how to do this. What they did was put a coat over it. <laughs> but it's quite interesting because the other displays won't dim at all. 
So my point is that technology is fantastic, but it needs to be designed to do what the user wants it to do. And I happen to think that iMarist can help that process of enabling the user to take charge of the technology as opposed to the technology driving the user. So I'm now going to, this is one another frightening thing about talking about technology, is trying to make this stuff work. So you're going to bear with me because you can give me a bugger off pill as soon as I touch this, I can see it coming. Now here's an interesting, it's not doing what it should do, Paul, Paul, panic. There we go. Right, this is, uh, hopefully it's going to start in just a second. Paul. I have to push start it, do I? Thank you. I will situate you. This is um, an incident in the Strait of Singapore, March the 2nd this year, between a tanker called Bex Halil, which is the, uh, a bulk carrier, sorry, and a smaller vessel called uh, Thuan Mai. Perfectly calm day, fantastic day. I think this is a brilliant presentation because what you're seeing is a ship that happened to video this from a distance. The ship is over here. The two ships are colliding here. And the ECTIS system, the electronic navigation system, is tracking exactly what happened. It's an absolutely fantastic demonstration of what can be done with digital technology. So you're seeing this situation where this vessel, and I haven't been able to get hold of the investigation report, hasn't reported yet, but I reckon he was the overtaking vessel. The guy ahead uh, should have been maintaining a steady course. Don't know if he was or wasn't. But between the two of them, somebody wasn't keeping a good look at. It starts off looking quite funny. It gets less and less funny as the thing progresses. And you can see all the time the digital navigation system, which somebody has been able to download off the internet probably, is showing you exactly what was going on. Last time I saw anything like this was HMS Jupiter back in the Cold War when she had a problem with razzing and she ended up wrapping herself around the bow of the tanker. But this one is probably almost certainly down to bad lookout and bad procedures. But the fantastic thing about the technology is you can piece it all together now. Go back 10, 15, 20 years, this would have taken many, many days of investigation, interviewing, reconstruction to work out what had happened in that instant. I'm not going to run it for ages, but there's another point where down here another vessel is coming in from the bottom left-hand corner, and he has to go careering off over here. You can see it happening now. And he can see this all happening in glorious technicolor in front of him, and he's doing a screaming term to starboard to get out of the way. Now, this is in a very, very intensive area of shipping in the Singapore Strait. And it really makes you think about how, let's see if I can move on from here. Just, excuse me, I'll just tackle the technology again. So that's an example. Here's another one. This is Costa Concordia. Now, um, about three or four days after Costa Concordia, I was sitting in bed having a cup of tea with my poor wife, and uh, I was able to download off the internet, open source, the track of Costa Concordia, and I've got loads of these clips, I won't bore you with them all this evening, which is the red one. Now I was, four days afterwards, downloading the track of the Costa Concordia and what she'd probably done from the internet. Um, and Again, if I'd gone back 10, 20, 30 years ago with a grounding in a similar situation, that would have been a massive reconstruction task. And there's no way that the general public would have been in a position to see what went on. More interestingly, if you look at the blue track, is that somebody went back and bit of a, did a bit of analysis recently and checked her earlier tracks, and she used to routinely do that run past that island, except that he had a slightly better approach when he did it back the year before. Really, really interesting. Open source information, high quality, high accuracy, available on the internet. So who was on those bridges? Any idea what sort of people were on those bridges? Watch keepers. Watch keepers, yeah. Watch keepers, what sort of watch keepers? Second. Second. Yeah. Any idea? So what sort of training had they had? What sort of preparation had they had? What training, what experience, 
how were they being trained to go about their jobs? And not just the guys on the bridges, but what about the guys down in the engine rooms? How are they trained to do damage control and those sorts of things? Very, very interesting little piece of information in the press recently. Uh, Costa, or rather Carnival Cruises, are now investing 300 million reinstalling diesel generators, emergency diesel generators, in the engine rooms of all of their cruise ships as a result of the Costa Concordia incident. So really, the question I'm going to ask is, what sort of people were on those bridges? And this coming back to the digital point. And there's lots of talk about the various generations. You've heard them all. Anybody here think they're a digital fossil? I think that's quite insulting, actually. Um, generation X, Generation Y, Generation Z. Much more interesting to think about them as digital immigrants and digital natives. So, hands up all those born before 1990. <laughs> You're all digital immigrants. You're all digital immigrants. But you've all got mobile phones and you've all got computers. So here's a little think, a little think about what the future looks like. And you can download these. There's loads of these clips um, on Microsoft's website. It's giving me a bugger off pen again. an amalgamation of several film clips and if you go onto the Microsoft website if you're, if you're interested you'll find them um, I think they're amazing that one I think looks ahead to about 2020 so from about now to 2020 and then they've got other ones that go ahead a bit further but those are the sorts of technologies that the digital natives are growing up with and they're the sorts of technologies that are out there now and probably need to start going to sea and being used in the maritime environment if they haven't already been in some areas. So hands up those who were born after 1990. Hooray, we've got one. Congratulations, I'm going to pick on you. What was your name again? Richard. Richard. Thank you, Richard. I won't forget you because you're going to come back up again a bit later on. But the digital natives. And what, what are the characteristics, what are the difference between the two generations then? We were all taught learning. Oh, I'm wrong, pressing the wrong button. We were all taught learning. Everything had to be learned. But these guys are being taught look up. Are you allowed to use Google and that sort of thing all the time, Richard? Do you constantly on Google? You don't learn stuff off by heart. You learn stump, some stuff off by heart, but if you want to know a fact, you just Google it, don't you? Just search it. So you're being taught techniques to learn, to, to get information, how to get the information you need. So that's one characteristic, and of course, being able to look up when you're in remote locations, at sea, poor connectivity, etc., etc. There's some factors in there. We were all taught knowledge is power, pyramid structure. The guy at the top knows what's going on, keeps it all to himself, tells the others what to do. These guys are all taught sharing, partnerships, 
sharing information where it suits them, finding another partner later on when it doesn't. We've all been taught individualism. They've all been taught communities. And we've all been very precious about our privacy. But they're in a world of transparency. Facebook, put your thoughts up there after a good run ashore the night before, don't you? My kids do. You're more, more private. Yeah. Really. Do these characteristics strike a chord? Yeah. Okay. So these are differences between us and them. So we've got a different type of person operating in the maritime environment. They need more guidance and coaching. They seek a different work-life balance. My kids work at all sorts of funny times of the night and day, and uh, it really irritates the hell out of me that my daughter, preparing for her exams, was constantly texting and Facebooking and all the rest of it. And when you say, what the hell are you doing? Oh, well, I'm just getting that bit of information from Joe Bloggs. Um, they're not so interested in travelling work-wise because they just know they can go and hop on Ryanair, have a very uncomfortable cheap flight somewhere and then they're on the beach. Um, they're very at home with technology but I would question their understanding of it and that's another theme. But the other interesting thing to me is they're being taught and trained by digital immigrants. Now it's quite an interesting thing here. It depends how much you put into this business of immigrants and natives. But it's very, very interesting that we're trying to teach them what we did with our technology, but they're approaching it from the point of view of their technology. And I think it's something we've got to think about. So it's growing like Topsy. We all know about Moore's Law. There's a lot of people out there trying to knock Moore's, uh, Moore's Law to pieces and say that it's, um, it's about to die. Uh, but all I can see is that every time you go and look for a laptop, you're looking for something that could do a lot better. All the indications are that when you can't get silicon any thinner, uh, they'll find something else. Graphene, apparently, is the latest thing. And these incredible uh, semiconductors are being continuously built. So all the indications are that Moore's Law will continue with some variations on a theme. Uh, and there's all sorts of graphs out there which I'm afraid my head exploded about when computers or supercomputing technology will catch up with the human brain and then will actually become more than all the human brains on the planet. And that's the point at which I, I lost the plot. But the point is, there's a lot of technology going and it's happening very quickly. So smartphones, here's the take up of smartphones over the last few years. It's just extraordinary. And of course, these are in some developing parts of the world. Uh, adaptation of, uh, or adoption of tablets grew like Topsy, and uh, I think will continue to do so. And we're seeing those coming in more and more, and they featured a lot in that video earlier. And consumers are driving some of these technological developments. And I think this is really interesting. This is a fascinating book. It's not a particularly difficult read. It's not very expensive. Every man and his dog is reading in the, state, apparent, in the States, apparently. But the point is that they, these platforms that they've developed, these business platforms, give the user something that the user didn't know they needed and then encourage the user to develop them. And it's all part of that partnering, that community, that sharing of ideas. And so now every man and his dog is out there making applications that the original producers didn't think of. And so they're constantly putting new ideas into these platforms. And of course, they're trying to make them simpler and more intuitive, which takes me back to my picture of that digital navigation system earlier. So it's growing exponentially, but it's also driving this autonomous future, these remote operations. And I think this is something which the maritime world is a bit worried about. But I think it's something that we have got to discuss and that we've got to lead and that we've got to get the governance in place for before it's done to us. And there's lots of evidence out there of what this autonomy can do. And again, this is... Um, a video that I pinched off the Fugo presentation. I'm going to try and make it work. So what I want to show you next is a video of 20 of these little robots flying in formation. They're monitoring their neighbor's position. They're maintaining formation. The formations can change. They can be planar formations. They can be three-dimensional formations. 
as you can see here, they collapse from a three-dimensional formation into a planar formation, and to fly through obstacles, they can adapt the formations in the, on the fly. So again, these robots come really close together, as you can see in this figure eight flight. They come within inches of each other. And despite the aerodynamic interactions with these propeller blades, they're able to maintain stable flight. Another application I want to show you, again, this is in our lab. This is work done by Quentin Lindsay, who's a graduate student. So his algorithm essentially tells these robots how to autonomously build cubic structures from truss-like elements. So his algorithm tells the robot what part to pick up, when, and where to place it. So in this video you see, and it's sped up 10, 14 times, you see three different structures being built by these robots. And again, everything is autonomous, and all Quentin has to do is to give them a blueprint of the design that he wants to build. So all these experiments you've seen thus far, all these demonstrations have been done with the help of motion capture systems. So what happens when you leave your lab and you go outside into the real world? And what if there's no GPS? So this robot is actually equipped with a camera and a laser range finder, laser scanner. And it uses these sensors to build a map of the environment. What that map consists of are features like doorways, windows, people, furniture, and it then figures out where its position is with respect to the features. So there is no global coordinate system. The coordinate system is defined based on the robot, where it is and what it's looking at. And it navigates with respect to those features. So I want to show you a clip with algorithms developed by Frank Shen and Professor Nathan Michael that shows this robot entering a building for the very first time and creating this map on the fly. So the robot then figures out what the features are, it builds a map, it figures out where it is with respect to the features, and then estimates this position 100 times a second, allowing us to use the control algorithms that I described to you earlier. So this robot is actually being commanded remotely by Frank, but the robot can also figure out where to go on its own. So suppose I were to send this into a building and I had no idea what this building looked like, I can ask this robot to go in, create a map, and then come back and tell me what the building looks like. So here, the robot is not only solving the problem of how to go from point A to point B in this map, but it's figuring out what the best point B is at every time. So essentially it knows where to go to look for places that have the least information, and that's how it populates this map. Isn't it amazing? I just think they're fantastic. Coming somewhere to a, a maritime sector near you. Could use that for confined spaces, couldn't you? Technology uh, has been identified as the future of the UK's economy. Uh, David Willits wrote this little booklet. You can get it free from Amazon. It's got eight great technologies. Uh, I can't remember all of them, but it's things like stem cell science, um, renewables, uh, transport, um, uh, robots, robotics, space applications, and those sorts of things. And those technologies have been tra uh, translated into the government's um, seven technological innovation centers, which cover all those themes as well, which are clusters of academic, industrial, and government expertise. Uh, the Space Application Center, for example, is in, uh, uh, or they, they call them catapults, which is the branding name, but the Space Applications Catapult is in Harwell, uh, based alongside all the other sort of space capability of the UK got there and the government is investing in these technologies and uh, they have particular relevance I would argue to the maritime. I found this um, in uh, picking around in newspapers and things it's very interesting to think about this that the future is already here it's just not very evenly distributed. We see this in the news recently. We've got our first uh, Air Force winged pilots who sit in an, uh, an office environment and operate UAVs over uh, the Middle East and Afghanistan. They've just received their wings. Can we imagine a desk bound off the watch? And uh, if not, why not? It's a conversation that needs to be had, and I'll explain why in a minute. 
Oh, I was going to ask, that's my prompt. Um, does anybody think we don't have autonomously controlled ships at sea? Well, here you go. This is a protector. This is a vessel that I saw in I uh, INEC uh, last week or, or um, IMDEX in Singapore. The Singaporeans operate these things. There you go. They operate them in the Singaporean Strait at the moment, and they've operated them off Aden for counter piracy control, uh, patrols. They do about 30 knots, and they've got all sorts of variations on a theme. They've got them armed with weapons, they've got them to be used for dis uh, um, discharging depth charges, and uh, they're controlled autonomously. The interesting thing is there's no governance in place for them, as far as I can tell. Uh, the rule of the road anti-collision regulations haven't been changed. Um, what would you do if the officer watch and that was heading towards you? How do you know that if you follow the anti-coal regs, it's going to follow it? And the, interest, the other interesting thing is, what training has the operator had? And when you take Moore's law and pack that thing full of algorithms, and apparently it's full of algorithms and it can do collision avoidance, how do you know it's going to do what you want it to do? And what's the governance for it? At the moment, I'm told they operate them uh, by just having exclusion zones and these things patrol around the harbour and ships aren't allowed to go anywhere near them. But it's really, really interesting. They're out there already. And as you can see, they're flipping quick. How about 3D printing? Did everybody see the, uh, the business of the 3D gun that was printed just recently and fires a live round? And these amazing photocopiers that make all this amazing um, equipment or stores or spares or whatever they might be. What's that going to mean for the bulk container, the container trade from China to Europe? What happens if we start making these items back in Europe? You won't need to import them from cheap labor in China anymore. What will that do to shipping patterns? What will that do to the global economy? I think it's an amazing development, absolutely amazing development. Anybody read about this in the newspaper about three or four days ago? BAE is now flying a test bed. It started off operating in controlled airspace over the Irish Sea and just recently has operated uh, in um, controlled airspace over land. I think it was going from somewhere near Wharton up to Inverness. Um, it has, to be fair to them, it's got two pilots in it, but they're sitting drinking coffee and the guy back uh, at base somewhere is operating it. Who fancies flying on a plane without pilots in it? Come on. Anybody? Go on, anybody fancy flying it? Who, who, would, who would get in an airplane without pilots? That's amazing, because last time I asked that question, I didn't get any hands at all. Really interesting. And yet the Docklands Light Railway, hop on board that quite happily. It's really interesting, isn't it? And I was told uh, that when New hasn't, hasn't Newcastle on Tyne got a, a light, an unmanned uh, uh, light railway system? It came in in the late 90s, early, early 2000s. And they had to put a seat and a man in it at the front because people wouldn't go on it. Even though he was doing nothing, he sat there and then people would use it. But of course, we now use the Docklands Light Railway. Personally, you wouldn't get me on board a plane without a pilot for all the tea in China, but there you go, I am a pilot. But I just think it's, a, I just think it's amazing that this is what's going on. And so we in the maritime have got to think about this. We've got to think about it. What would be the benefits of having uh, an autonomously operated ship? And if you're going to do that, does it have to look like a ship? And that, would it need a superstructure? It could be cylindrical. It could be semi-submerged. Does it need to do 12, 15 knots if it's carrying iron ore or oil and it's on a predictable cycle? It could be doing three, four knots, couldn't it? Leave the thing at the fairway boy, off it goes. Pick it up 10 days later at the fairway boy on the other side of the pond. And these are the things that have got to be thought about. But more importantly, if you're going to bring this sort of technology in, you've got to think about the governance and the standards that will enable it to operate safely and do what the user wants it to do. And again, I think iMaris has got a part to play in that. There's always a but. This poem was written, any idea when, any offers on when this might be written? Anybody know who wrote it? It was written in the turn of the last century. Yeah, well done. We had a laureate of the fleet, apparently, back in 1920. I've got this fantastic, I've got this fantastic little book. You might remember him, Nigel. But, um, <laughs> but, um, 
Um, that was unfair, wasn't it? I beg your pardon. But, uh, and he, he, was a, he, he was a digital fossil, I reckon. But um, there's a fantastic book, and it's got lots and lots of really, I could have uh, put verses up all evening. But uh, the point is that there's something about this technology and the standards that lie behind it. So coming back to Richard, where we left him earlier on, who is digitally savvy, or, or is he? This is the sort of thing that his, he and his ilk, he and his uh, uh, friends all do. Um, and I think some of these numbers were probably changed since I last put the slide, this slide up. But the really interesting thing is this business about how do we translate that experience that we've won over many hundreds of years, what bits of it do we translate into the future uh, generations. This is the Google automatic car. Um, story has it that it did 250,000 miles before it had its first accident and it was being driven by a human being when that happened. So it did 250,000 miles and then when the human being got in it, it had a crash. Uh, you can all think about this. I, mean, I, I just think it's a fascinating development. We're all talking about it now. You're going to swing up onto the M5 and you'll slot in behind a little wagon of, uh, of cars, get your coffee out, get your newspaper out, send a few emails and trundle along till you get to Bristol when you slide off again. Well, just going back to my aviation example, um, flight simulation training for pilots, I think they have to do something like 30 hours a year so that when the automatic stuff stops working, they'll know what to do. So what's the f driving simulation going to be for you to be able to operate this particular machine? And how are you going to know that something's going wrong in time to put down your newspaper, put down your coffee, pick it up and, and take charge of it? Will you even spot that it's gone wrong? And are we all happy to drive at exactly 50 miles an hour for hours on end with no variation on the theme? What would that do to our economy? I don't know, but this is the technology that's out there. So here you go. Here's some examples of Richard. This is, this is my daughter for you. My daughter phones me and says, where am I? The white arrow has disappeared. Um, so this is a guy in a Cardo van uh, in the Lake District. And this is, this is a van being airlifted out of uh, the Swiss Alps. Funny, aren't they, actually? They're, they are quite amusing. If you think about it, they're actually a catastrophic system failure. So on the one hand, it's funny. On the other hand, this is a, a sign at the top of my lane back in Hampshire, because they're fed up with towing big vehicles that have followed SatNav uh, out backwards. It's not very far. It's, it's Exton, actually, John, just up the hill, the top of the hill there by Corhampton. Um, so it's actually very funny, but actually it's not funny, because it's a catastrophic system failure. The SatNav has failed. The telematics that go with it have failed, the maps that go with it have failed, and the human operator has failed. And if you put that into a different environment, it really is not quite so funny. Bottom right-hand corner, Royal Magistry, 1995, went to ground on Nantucket Shoal after two and a half days having sailed from Bermadou. Um, somebody, I think actually it had been wind action, had caused the GPS aerial lead to disconnect. The GPS went into DR. They had GPS on one side, and right beside it they had Loran Charlie. Loran Charlie was telling them within a mile of where they were. GPS was flashing DR, DR, DR. None of them had seen a GPS failure in three years, the investigation found. They went, they managed, they were plotting on a paper chart. They plotted for two and a half days. They went to ground 17 and a half miles west of track, having been called by an anxious fisherman saying, Oi, Lofty, you're too big to be here. <laughs> the off, one of the officer watches had lied to the captain about a light that he hadn't seen. They saw a whole raft of lights that they should never have seen, and they still drove themselves onto the putty. They had 1,500 people on board. Fortunately, nobody was lost. But a really interesting example of the user believing the information that they see. Richard, do you believe your GPS? When you look at your smartphone, do you believe it's telling you where you are? Do you know that there's a pool of errors around that arrow? Yeah, that's not the pool of errors, that's just, uh, but did you know that it's not the middle of the circle, but it's a pool of errors around it? 
didn't know. My daughter didn't know that either. Um, the point is that this technology is incredibly good, but it's my point around are we, are we de developing a generation of GPS operators or are we developing a generation of GPS navigators? people who understand how the system works. And if we are doing the former, do we need to do something about it? There is another documentary out there which will tell you that we now have a generation of young people who cannot read a map. They cannot read a paper map. They don't know how to orient it and they don't know how to read it. Um, I refuse to take, I refuse to give my GPS to my daughter when we went off to France last year. She was going off roaming around seeing all her mates around southern England and she was bereft. And I thought for a little while about buying another one for her and I thought, no, you got a map, you get on with it. And she got on with it and she found her way around. But the point is that it is easy to get sucked into the fact that this technology is so good. Top right, Air France, the Air France crash off Brazil. That was a classic example. There's a harrowing uh, uh, transcript of what went on with that co cockpit. Uh, the third pilot who was flying the aircraft stalled that aircraft three times until it hit the sea. And yet there were plenty and plenty of indications and warnings that that is what he was doing. But the other pilots couldn't see what he was doing because the system was being operated by a joystick. They have joysticks on either side. I'll show you a picture in a minute. They don't have the traditional yokes and throttles and the rest of it, which Boeing have put into their aircraft. And so the other pilot couldn't see that the third pilot was keeping the stick back. And the point at which the captain had come into the cockpit and spotted it and said, we are stalling, pull up, pull up, the third pilot said, but I have been for the last 40,000 feet. And then it was too late. So it's absolutely fascinating. Top left-hand corner, flight 5191, uh, late uh, about 2007, something like that, taxied out to runway 26 and took off. Unfortunately, he should have been on runway 22. There were two pilots in the cockpit. It was just a small inter-city hopper going from Lexington International to somewhere like Norfolk. Um, and they lined up at the end of the runway. And cutting a long story short, there were two major visual indications that they were on the wrong runway. One was that their gyro was 40 degrees off, so the arrow was showing them 26. Sorry, 22, two, not 26. Um, and the other was there were two big signs either side of the aircraft on the side of the runway saying 26. But they took off. And what that turned out to be was a massive systemic error uh, which went far, far beyond just the two pilots. And they'd been prepared to see what they thought they were seeing. And they didn't use these other visual indicators to um, correct their actions. And it's a very interesting thing because in the old days you had to manually process your, uh, or manually correct um, your gyro compass before you launched. And the way you did it was when you were lined up on the runway, you cranked around the knob, brought the heading arrow onto the runway where you were on. It was part of your pre-flight, I'll start again, your pre-flight checks. And uh, nowadays you have automatically processing gyros, so that particular check has dropped off the checklist. A bit like uh, Carnival stopped installing standby generators. So very, very interesting thinking about the interface between the human being and the technology that we operate. I've made this point quite a lot. ENCs and e-navigation, Richard, I'm not getting at you, I, I promise you I'm not getting you, but you know, there are people out there, most of the watches think that what they're seeing on their digital chart is true. They don't realize that a lot of the charts that are out there have been created digitally from old lead line surveys, stuff that was done back at the turn of the century, but it's in color, it's on a 19 inch display, it's got GPS on top of it, it's gotta be okay, good to go, good to go. The fact that the local chart datum does not align with WD84, which is the global digital chart datum, they don't know that. So what do they need to know? to be able to operate these systems effectively. Or maybe the solution is take them out of the loop. This was Nancy Leveson. She did a study into the, uh, the tragedy of Flight 5191. 
and uh, she takes a systemic approach. We, we used to worry a lot about the chain of events, whereas she's much more holistic and I would say three-dimensional in what she thinks about and how she understands um, instance. And she's made this particular point, which I think is absolutely spot on. So training is really important. This is the Air France cockpit. These are the controls. So there's no traditional yoke. And when you operate this stick, if you want a 30 degree angular bank, you move it to the right, so you get your 30 degree angular bank. When you've got the angular bank that you want, you let go of it and it comes back to the vertical position. And this one doesn't move at all. Boeing have installed the traditional yoke, all the traditional controls, and they get, even though it's fly-by-wire, they get, the pilot gets a resistance, apparently. So it's different ways of doing it, but these are some of the problems of operating these modern systems and training the people to operate them. This is uh, my point around uh, robust governance and standards. Um, this is taken from digital charting, don't worry about it too much, but if I um, explain to you that in the old days a hydrographer would give a chart to a user and the user couldn't change that chart. That chart was exactly what the hydrographer had intended. And a couple of hundred years worth of skills had gone into that, presenting the information, which none of it was ever perfect, but presenting the best information in the format that the navigator would use. And navigators grew up alongside cartographers and hydrographers and the rest of it. When you come into this digital world, and I would argue this is the same for aviation, medicine, a whole raft of other ones, suddenly, the bit that the hydrographer controls, or the cartographer controls, is no longer the bit that the user is using. So nowadays, the hydrographer produces all the data, gets hold of the data, puts it into a digital format, and makes an ENC. But he doesn't give it to the operator. And he doesn't know how the operators are going to use it. And all the different OEMs are out there. Sorry, I, I, come on for that a second. Let me just click these on now. The, the Ectis manufacturers are using the standards that have been produced by international institutes of one form or another to make their software and their hardware. And the two are then joined up by some Dell computer on board the ship, and they're expected to work. And then the officer watch can change all the settings. I, I find it amazing. The officer watch can turn off soundings. The officer watch can zoom in and out on inappropriate scales. And the cartographer doesn't have a clue what they're doing with the charts as they use them. So the user really has no control over any of it. He, he or she just takes what they're given. But the standards at the top are absolutely fundamental. And this is my point about technology being done to the user. I don't think that these standards, these governances and regulations were in place in time to influence the development of e-navigation as well as might have been the case. And so my point is that as we start thinking about the impact of technology in the maritime sector is to do that bit at the top as soon as possible. Even if it's only to say autonomous shipping over our dead bodies never, 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 that will do as a standard. But if you are going to have autonomous shipping, and I'll take you back to the, uh, the Singaporean example, what governance are you going to put in place? And the governance has got to be there in pace with technology. Otherwise, the technologists will do it to them. Um, I'm nearly finished. I said I would talk about um, positive controls of shipping. There's a, uh, an EU-funded project being run actually by GLA and uh, Trinity House is giving leadership to it called ACCES. It's an awful acronym. It's Accessibility for Shipping Efficiency Advantages and Sustainability. Whew. Um, but take it uh, simplistically, when I first sailed around in the North Sea about 20, 30 years ago, it was a pretty open sea space. There was a, quite a lot of control down in the Straits of Dover, but in the lifetime of officers who were training me, they could tell you that it was a free-for-all through the Straits of Dover in the 1960s. There were no shipping lanes, there were no um, traffic separation schemes then. They came in slowly because of the, the intensity of shipping. But you could operate as an independent commanding officer anywhere you wanted, pretty much, in the North Sea. Nowadays, that is really changing. This is a hugely complex sea space. And the tracks you're seeing there are AIS tracks. AIS is an automated uh, information system. Basically, every ship sends its information back to a central server. And you can see the intensity of the shipping uh, that goes on there. 
and I, I could go on with this for hours, I won't. But at the moment, if you think about just renewables, offshore renewables, at the moment there's 440 square kilometers of sea space being used in the North Sea. And they predict that over the course of the next few years, it's going to go up to 28,500 square kilometers. And this is going to have an absolutely massive effect on the ability of ships to operate in the North Sea. There's a ferry route that goes from Hull down to Zeebrugge, and they're going to put a hoofing great big um, wind farm in the middle of that ship's track. And the ferry operator has said, I simply will have to cut out that ferry route because the cost and the pain of transiting through that, that um, renewable farm, that offshore wind farm, is going to be prohibitive. I can't keep operating like that. So there is a, a huge scheme going on looking at how do you manage these very, very complex sea spaces. And it's very interesting because it's really irritating the maritime community because it's starting to talk about, well, we're going to have to control how shipping operates through these areas and it's talking about having shipping streets and of course all the mariners are out there are saying over oh, my dead body I'm an independent commanding officer you ain't gonna do that but I think this is so serious and it's not just the renewables there's lots of other stuff oil and gas and various other things going on but I think it may come to the point where you might be a um, I, I've got to be careful what sort of country I'm but you might be in it an inadequately equipped freighter coming from somewhere in the middle or far east and you come around the corner of Ushant and you'll be told sorry Lofty you ain't coming through the North Sea you haven't got the right fit, you haven't been trained properly, you're not certified, you're not coming through the North Sea. So some real, really, really thorny problems and interesting issues that need to be dealt with. So some takeaways, you've heard most of this already. Um, Technology is with us, it ain't going to stop. Um, I think it's quite exciting. I think we are going to see more and more pressure for remote and autonomous operations. Um, social media, we've talked about the digital native. I think we've got to really understand the Richards of this world and really think about their needs and how they're going to operate in that environment. Richard, can you imagine doing six months away from home without internet connectivity? You can't, you can't, it won't happen. There you go. It won't happen. Thank you. I'll buy you a beer later. I don't think technology is necessarily cheaper. I certainly don't think it's easier. There's a lot of people out there who thought the advent of e-navigation was going to be cheaper. You wouldn't have to have so many people on the bridge. Um, you wouldn't have to train people as much. Uh, in fact, you just wouldn't have to do any of it. I think it, it, the difficulty we've got at the moment is we bring this technology in. It's going to be more expensive. It's going to require more people, more training, and more understanding so that it's safe. Training and education are therefore vital. We've got to do something about um, that, those governance and standards issues that I talked about. And how many of our business models are sustainable in this new environment? So here you go. There's this amazing contrast, isn't there, between our community, our maritime community, and the fact that I read the other day, the first figure I read was 30,000 people have signed up, and the figure I read yesterday is that 80,000 people have signed up to go on a one-way ticket to Mars. Now, the technology that goes with that is amazing. Richard, would you go on a one-way ticket to Mars? You'd probably have internet connectivity, I reckon, <laughs> and your guitar. Depends on your age. Yeah. Uh, I was saying if there was a pretty blonde involved, I might go. But um, it, it's really interesting. So the technology to achieve this is absolutely amazing. Sorry, somebody else wants to go to Mars? Has somebody signed up? Second. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a really interesting, isn't it? So here's a sector, the space sector, where this amazing technological uh, achievement is going to happen. And we, the Maritime, are perhaps a little bit slower to, uh, to take on board technology. That's probably a good thing, but I think we should do some thinking about it. Thank you very much indeed for listening to me, ladies and gentlemen. Question. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
was, <laughs> whatever it was, I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> it also gives me the chance to thank you very much for a fascinating talk and very, very exciting. Uh, my question is about the autonomous vehicles. The aeroplane you showed shows that BA systems and others are negotiating with the Civil Aviation Authority and similar authorities to establish how to do it. Yep. Is anybody doing anything similar with IMO? Because the first hurdle, it seems to me, is the collision regulations and yep. the requirement for a 24-hour visual lookout. Yep. We need to get a system which will satisfactorily substitute visual lookout, yep. get it certified, or get the, the, the rules for certifying and assuring it, getting agreement through IMO that it works, and yep. there are steps after that. Yeah. If, if, any, if anybody's doing it, who is it? If they aren't, who should it be? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm very astute question. Uh, the answer, as far as I know, is they aren't. Um, I spoke to a couple of um, well-known maritime institutions in the UK, which will remain nameless. Um, the first one I spoke to, I was talking about this idea of should we have a different kind of desk officer, uh, sorry, desk, a different kind of deck officer uh, that is trained for the environment they find on the bridge, all the technology, the remote machinery control, and all those sorts of things. And the answer, and, and should there be, you know, a relationship with IMRS? And the answer was over our dead bodies. You know, deck officers are fine. Um, and the other guy I spoke to was about the ability to plot the human geography of the oceans using uh, Earth observation uh, technology in space. And the answer to that was, you just want to spy on us. So I don't think that that thinking is going on. And of course, as you know, IMO is a very, very slow moving organization. And, and I think that the aviation world is something that we should watch. Actually, aviation and medicine is another one where they tend to think about, this thing's coming on a steady bearing, we ought to do something about how it could be done or think about the standards and governance that goes, goes with it. Um, so I think uh, that IMRS should help lead this debate. And, and I think that IMRS, that the approach that IMRS has taken over the, over the last few years, to gently have this discussion, mindful of the point I made about the Axis project, where they are upsetting the mariner, but you haven't got to do very much to upset the mariner. Um, but it, you know, we've got to have this conversation. So I think IMRS could help, and I think the IMO should be leading on it, but I wouldn't be putting 10 pounds down as to when they're going to start. So it's not a very good answer, I'm afraid, but you perfectly make the, uh, the correlation between the aviation world and uh, the maritime world. It's really interesting. Um, a chap called Professor David Last is a bit of an aviator, and he's very much involved in um, e-navigation and those sorts of things. And he's, his view is that we should all be eyes down flying by instruments at sea. Now, my view on that is, Again, that's nonsense because the environment is completely different. It's a two-dimensional environment. It's not a three-dimensional environment. Um, and, uh, but but we've, got to un we've got to be talking to these people. How do they do it? And what can we learn? And driving that debate. So it's not a very good answer, but, but the linkage is perfect. How do we uh, sort of breed the just look out the window, the system can be wrong in our digital natives? Yeah. Really good question, isn't it? How do you? And, and the, um, the, the, the problem is that intimate belief in the system. And so I, I, I've been wrestling with how do you teach navigation? If you go into a traditional college, go into Dartmouth or Warsash or Liverpool or somewhere like that, they're teaching them how to use a star spanner. Okay, now most of us would say, yep, they need to know how to do that. But actually, do they need to know how to do that? Or would they be better off understanding that there's a pool of errors around GPS and really understanding how the system works? More frightening, I was on board a, a 95,000 ton cruise ship in Antigua a while back, somebody had to do it. Um, and uh, I was stunned that they have no method of taking a visual bearing. There are no pylorus, no repeats. So I said, well, you know, how, what's your backup navigation system? Well, we, we do radar. So then I said, okay, well, you know, um, what happens if GPS fails? Well, we use radar. Well, did you know that your radar takes a GPS feed and it will fail as well? I know, oh, by the way, your telephone will fail. And they just don't know that. So their, their system knowledge 
is, is what worries me. So your question is, is absolutely right. We've got to think about it. And I, again, I think institutes like IMRS can help with that. What would the syllabus be for the digital navigator? So that you know, if I took my son, or we took Richard. Richard, come, come learn how to be a deck officer. Right, come on, chap. This is, this is a sextant. And uh, here's a paper chart, and here's how you do a fix. They say, get away. I just use GPS. I know when I get to see, I'm just going to use GPS. So how do, we, how do we make that digital navigator so that he or she understands the system and has got some idea of thinking back and then understands that you take some visual references? Those guys, the Ocado lorry, going down that track in the Lake District, must have had one or two visual cues on the way there. <laughs> Mustn't he? And there was that lovely, you know, the guy in the Mercedes when you know he drove over the side of a canal and phoned up Mercedes and said the navigator didn't work. Well, you know, didn't you look out the window? It's really interesting, isn't it? So, and we all do it. We all do it. Um, so how? And so I think there's, and I don't know the answer to it, but I know there's a need for it. How would you design that syllabus and train that person? Further to your comment, Admiral, do you think IMRS should be engaging with the Royal Institute of Navigation and the Nautical Institute and be involved in NAV at IMO? Yeah, all of those, yes, and more. And, and there is a big, have, you, have any of you seen the, um, the Lloyd's uh, tube map of London maritime governance in that amazing, I love that diagram. I personally think there's some amalgamation that's got to take place. I mean, I'll be shot when I walk out of here. I can tell, please, whatever you do, don't put this on the web. I'll be shot. But, you know, there's got to be some amalgamation, isn't there? Why, why you know, RIN and IMRS, you, you should be completely in bed with each other. Completely in bed. And the name was Jake Morse, by the way. It was Jake Morse. It was Jake Morse, yeah. But that's, I mean, when you say that, that's the other thing. You see, people protect their turf because these institutions have been around for long periods of time and they quite rightly want to preserve their membership and their turf. But is it helping uh, the, the digital natives as they come into this world? Sir. Hello. Um, thank you for a very, very interesting talk. Um, question that I've got is basically revolves around risk. Round. Risk. Risk, oh yeah. If we remove all people from all ships uh, and have things operating from the remote control, from a nice safe base, we then remove the risk and we make the whole operation a lot safer. We've still got the risk to the uh, ship, but the uh, risk to the human life is a bit seriously reduced. Um, have you got any comments? I, I, I think um, it is one of the ways of taking out, taking out the risk and uncertainty. So you take out the human element. But it's, it's counterintuitive, isn't it? It's, it's a very, very difficult thing to assess and to make happen. And it's the belief that the system will be fine. But if you, let's say you have that oil tanker bimbling happily across the Atlantic with um, with nobody on board, and it then collides with the semi-submerged um, container that was lost off a ship a few weeks back and it's got a hole, how do you get to it? How long is it going to take you to get to it? So there's a whole load of new techniques required to be able to do these things effectively, which brings you all the way back to the governance and the standards, and the cost effectiveness of it. You know, is it going to be cost effective? You know, the, the, one of the ways to get around this problem of, um, Richard, don't take this the wrong way, I'll come and apologise afterward, but the, the fact that Richard believes that the GPS is telling me exactly where he is, we think, well, okay, what we'll do is we'll just take Richard off the ship, get rid of it, you know, and then, then it won't be a problem. Actually, what might do better is to invest in Richard and train him better and give him better standards and have fewer Richards, but still have them on board. And that's the debate that could take place. Um, you could imagine uh, an unmanned bridge, lots of people talking about it, uh, but you might still have engineers on board and other staff. Um, 
you could do what Nigel suggested. You could have a, another way of doing the visual look at. But the anti, just going, I just remember another part, the anti-coal rigs. People don't realize that the anti-coal rigs are designed for a one-on-one -on -one situation and nothing else. But you saw the Singaporean one, there was a few people thinking anti-coal rigs there as they saw it taking place, as opposed to the people who'd been involved in it beforehand. So there's, you know, and there's all that computation going on. Pretty complex algorithms, I reckon. You know, rule 9-1 Foxtrot 3 or whatever it is, which is a complete nightmare to understand. How would you write an algorithm for that? You might do better to invest more in Richard. So that's the sort of debate I think we need to have. Not Take off the ships isn't going to do a lot for the cruise industry. Uh, well, actually, in the case of the Costa Concordia, they might have been safe. <laughs> but, and, you know, it's, it's really interesting, isn't it? Really, and what, what you could imagine a sea space. You know, can you imagine it? You're an independently commanded ship heading from A to B. And in that sea space, you come across a ship that's under positive control by somebody ashore. And an unmanned ship, which is under control where it might not be under control from anybody, sure, it might just be on some sort of um, auto autonomous computer system, and then the yachty bimbling through the middle of it. There's always a yachty, isn't there? So, you know, how, how, or are we going to get to the point where we say, yachties aren't allowed in the North Sea? <laughs> Thank you. I think it was an amazing presentation, although I might not agree with the last concept. Uh, if we go back to your governor's slide, you will notice that you have put that in the case of the International Maritime Organization was saying performance standards. Then there were some other organizations about there. That's the one. You have the IEC for type approval. Yeah. And analyzing your philosophical concept, whether you belong in a, in a family of people which they're born with technology or those they develop the technology. Uh, we end up discussing like uh, the Emirates could influence via the navigation point of view and the training of people. I would like to ask your opinion, is that where the problem is or is it with the problem is at the initial stage where we introduce technology, which is not yet marinized. Yeah. Because if you go into a test, you'll find performance standards that they exist for a long time. Yeah. But who wrote the first performance standards were the manufacturer of that, in my opinion, unfinished product. Because if you've got the young initial slide, a product that has a manual how it operates, the operator has a very good training, and I would say in certain occasions in Europe, a perfect training. But it still needs um, additional nodes to stand around the screen, then the product is not fit for purpose. Yeah. So my, my question to you is, what do you think that if we forget what's going on now and just as I'm arrest, with the addition of those top bits up there, we, con we convince organizations like the IMO that should not introduce non-marinized technology unless, unless it's been tested. Because what I see happening now, even through performance standards in IMO, we are another case of Microsoft. We develop Windows. That's why today we have Windows 7 and Windows 8, and we're going to have Windows 9. And uh, Mr. Gates says that this is a technology developed by you. Of course, because the beta version was given to us as being the final product. And I'm, t I'm just asking your opinion, because I think, personally, I think that's where we have the difference of philosophical understanding. The problem is that these, techn these technologies have been introduced just before they were ready for this purpose. Yeah. I, I, I don't think we are having a, a difference in opinion, and, and, I, and I don't have the answer. This, I, I personally think this was a very difficult thing, and the IMO had decided we are going to go papers, we are going to go down this route of digital, and come hell or high water, um, uh, we're going to drag everybody into it. But what they, what I don't think they did was tell the mariner that they'd done that. So the mariner didn't know the fragility of the system. So behind this rather, rather ruggedized looking box is a Dell, you know, 
240 or something, whatever they're called. And there was a lovely story a few months back where the UK Hydrographic Office received a telephone call on their customer help desk from a ship in the Bay of Biscay, and it was blowing an absolute bugger out there. It's about a sea state nine or something. And they called up and said, hey, we're a paperless ship. Both of our Ectus systems have gone down. We haven't got a clue where we are. What do we do? And this went on for about three hours or so, and eventually they worked out that all the USP plugs had vibrated out of the back of the computers, and that's why they'd lost their systems. So you're absolutely right. The, stand, the, the trouble with these standards up here, these performance standards and so on, they were, um, they were quite loose in their description, and therefore OEMs were able to interpret what they felt the, the governance was telling them. And the point you're making is that you should have more robust standards, which I would agree with entirely, but of course that takes time. Um, so you, this is the conundrum, and I'm not for a minute that this is easy to do. We're talking about having a, um, a new standards for ENCs. We're going to, uh, it gets very boring this, but S100 and S101. We've been working on this for 10 years. An industry out there, when you talk to them, they're all saying, um, yeah, we're really looking forward to S100 and 101 coming. That's the answer to the maiden's prayer. Ten years we've been working on those standards. So what happens is that the technologists, the, the, uh, the OEMs, just crack on and build their systems and stack them high and sell them fast. Um, the, so it's a, it's a really big issue. And that's why I think Nigel's point is smack on. You know, understanding what goes on in other environments. And there's a, there's a very clever um, chap up at York University who understands the human interface uh, within aviation and the medical sectors. And he says that he thinks, and the transport sector, so rail networks and so on, he reckons that the maritime sector is about 20 to 30 years behind those leading sectors. Interesting stuff, isn't it? Have I not bored you all yet? We have another Richard. Another Richard. No, I think he's a digital immigrant, judging by the look I, of him. I, and I'm from Carnival, so any questions Ooh. about the cruise? Ooh, there's always one, isn't there? You there's always make always one mistake, don't you? Did I get that wrong? Is that not a true story? Well, you did get a few facts wrong, but anyway, okay. that wasn't the point. I, the point, I, I agree. Thank you very much for an excellent lecture, and I agree with everything you said. But the point I wanted to make was that this lack of user-centered design and lack of system awareness applies equally in the engine room yep. as on the bridge. Yep. And if you read the MAIB report into the harmonic failure on the QM2, you can see that that is clearly yeah. the case. So I'm arrest has a role not only in this uh, sphere of e-navigation, but also in the engine room in making sure that we have exactly the same issue with uh, you know, digital natives yeah. in the engine room. Yeah. I, I think that's a very gentle reminder, and thank you. I, I was using bridge examples, but I completely agree that this is across the maritime sector as a whole. I mean, this goes right out into oil and gas, offshore renewables. You know, I, I'm stunned that I'm told that uh, the guys who are installing uh, wind farms have never really spoken to the oil and gas sector and how they do it with um, offshore infrastructures. Uh, so it's really interesting. And just, just on, I, I will um, hang my head in shame over, over Costa Concordia because the, the point I, I was trying to make there and, and looking back at it didn't make very well. I, I felt for Captain Chitina and I felt for everybody on board that ship because uh, in terms of, of the people who were operating, obviously we're concerned about the passengers as well, but, but in terms of operating a ship, I mean, I, I very, very, I mean, I, I was, I'm sure I was within a centimetre of putting endurance to ground. Uh, and, and I know I was, I was there in my dressing room, my knees knocking, and how the hell do I get myself out of this one? To have thought that somebody like me, two days later, could have been lying in bed working out what I had or hadn't done on, on their iPad was, is stunning. So, so who was looking after Shatino? You know, 
he, he went from, as I understand it, from being a, a security guy to driving a ship within nine years. Who trained him? Who coached him? Who mentored him? Who took him to one side afterwards and said, come on Lofty, you're in the poo, but we're going to help you through this? Who, who, who was there impounding all that documentation and stopping all that speculation out there um, in the press and that trial by all of us before half the passengers got ashore? And I, and I think there's, there's, a, there's a real issue in there around how you administer these, these events in the future. So, so uh, and, and everybody has decided that Shatino's a bad guy. But Nancy Leveson will be telling you that there's a systemic failure in there somewhere. And, and it'll, be, it'll be beyond Costa Concordia. But, but, but that's my guess. As, and I, so I, have, I, I sympathize with the situation those operators find themselves in. Yes, and I mean, Carnival's view is that it was a, a failure of the bridge team management. And that's why Carnival is now investing a lot mm. in training in Almira mm. at C-Smart in mm. bridge simulator and bridge team management training. I, I, I think it's, um, I, as I say, I have sympathy. I, I did a, um, had a, a fantastic cruise. In fact, I went to the rescue of um, uh, a Hurtigruten ship that got itself stuck on a well-known rock in Antarctica um, in 2007. Um, lovely ship, uh, and they mixed up local datum, local chart datum, and and WGS-84, and so they drove out on GPS and they were displaced by a couple of hundred yards and they got the rock smack on at 12 knots, 550 people on board. Um, beautiful ship, very well found, very well equipped, had all the kit inside for oil spill and all the rest of it, but they were completely stunned and didn't know what to do. There was white as sheets and just sitting there waiting for somebody else to come and sort it out. And these are the, it's a very, very hostile environment. It's not a particularly um, friendly environment stuck alongside the wall. You know, things go wrong stuck alongside the wall. As soon as you go out there on the briny, it's a different story. And so it's, it's a very, very difficult environment. But this cruise I did up the side of Norway um, in a Hurtigruten ship, you go on board the ship and you look at it and think, well, hang on a second, it's all open spaces. And there are decks that are open from top to bottom. You look at it, wow! How do you handle this? What do you do when it goes wrong? And it's a really, really challenging environment. It really is. How do you get four and a half thousand people into life rafts in 20 minutes? Incredible. Very difficult. So thank you for your gentle reminder. Um, Admiral, I think you've made the case for um, automated chips very well, and we expect to see them in um, soon. Uh, kind of picking up on Richard's point, I, I kind of don't entirely agree. Um, I think we have taken engineers from the deck plates of boiler rooms where they have smelt and felt and um, um, listened to the machinery. We've taken them from there and we put them in control rooms. Um, we've taken them from there uh, and given them... Um, electronic devices um, where, where they sit in their cabins. Uh, so uh, I don't think we're ever going to go back to putting people into machinery spaces. And so perhaps there is something to learn from that engineering experience um, to apply to, to this, uh, this aspect. Uh, and we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be frightened um, yeah. by, by this at all. Um, we can do this. That's a comment, not a question. My question uh, was, um, would you agree that um, autonomous cargo ships may well be the ultimate solution to counter piracy, and that might be the motivator <laughs> for shipping companies? Yeah. I, uh, um, I, I, I wouldn't say that I'm recommending autonomous shipping. I'm recommending that we think about how we would do it. Um, I think it's a really interesting question. If, if, you, if you had an autonomous cargo ship, um, the whole thing could be covered in barbed wire, couldn't it? 
Um, and actually, what's the pirate going after? Is he going after the people because they've got mums and dads and friends and family and all the rest of it, and therefore they can be ransomed? Or is he going after the containers and what's within it? Um, and how would he get you know, the GDP of, of, of a small island state ashore in, in the black market? I don't know. Um, so I think that it, it is an interesting question. You could imagine a lot of autonomous ships escorting it. Um, uh, there's all sorts of different variations on the theme. If you open your mind up to it and have the discussion as opposed to shutting down, and, and that's what I'm recommending is we, we have the discussion and we go back to that Lloyd's map of, of London Maritime and say, right, how do we all talk to each other? How do we get the RINs to talk to the IMRS and all the rest of it? And what are we going to do about these very real issues? And then get some demonstrators out there. Let's run a demonstrator. Why not? Do it somewhere safe, you know, across the North Atlantic or something, and then see if, if we can get that demonstrator running. Do a BAE. Um, um, just, just very quickly, you mentioned a few times in your presentation about coaching and mentoring yeah. our digital native. Uh, I see this as a very positive thing. It's something that we've done in the engineering world for many, many years. Do you think that and the increase in technology will improve the training for deck officers in the future? I mean, we say goodbye to the slide room, so you can't grow with people. Yeah. It's, it's a great idea, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but do you think we'll see a big improvement? Uh, I, I think the, uh, again, these are Lambert opinions, um, but I, I think that the maritime world could really benefit from a coaching and mentoring ethos. I mean, who looks after these guys? You get a, a captain of a ship, comes back, he's been doing a bulker or something for the last four months, goes ashore for four months, goes home, and then four months later is in Forley on board an oil tanker. Completely different Ectus system, probably a different engine room system, different deck systems, brand new team, never met him before, half of them have just turned up as well, and he sails to the Far East. So who's coaching him? And there again, I think I'm RS and the thinking that's going into CPD and the Marine Learning Alliance and all that other stuff that you're your executive are working on are absolutely spot on, absolutely spot on. So could we bring coaching into this broader environment? Who looks after Shatino in between his deployments? Because all he does is go home. What about the distance learning that comes into it? There's an organization called uh, the Hydrographic Academy down in Plymouth, Plymouth University, have just started. Uh, they did it in conjunction with Fugro. They set it up in conjunction with Fugro. And the idea was you're in a, a, a difficult offshore environment, uh, connectivity is poor, the companies don't want to be sending youngsters back for to do courses for three months at a time with all the expense that goes with it. So they've come up with a dongle with a course on it, very, very high grade. Uh, training, high quality training videos which the trainees look at time and time and time again. Uh, they started this I think about a year ago. They've got 200 students who have already signed up to it. And, and yet, and, and uh, amazingly, when they took this course, which is very high quality, actually, I, th I think it's 200 man hours to produce each hour of video, and the tutor who is giving the lecture is also your tutor. Um, uh, at the end of Skype or telephone or face-to-face -face or whatever it might be that you do in between. Um, and yet the IHO refused to accredit that course. Oh, well, Nick, might I just make a, a comment? I've been grappling in my mind as to what the IMRS pitch ought to be going forward. Um, and I note from David Willett's book and what the government has announced about putting some funding forward to um, help this technology come forward is that it is described as MAS, it's Maritime Autonomous Systems. Yeah. And I'm wondering whether the IMRS strength, the engineer's strength, is taking the holistic approach and looking at the system. It's not just buying the vehicle or making the vehicle uh, work and sustain at sea. It is all the other things that you have touched on today, but our uniqueness perhaps is that ability to take the holistic view. The president of the Royal Institute of Navigation, we did meet at uh, Ocean Business in Southampton, uh, Peter Beatty I think his name is, he was extremely interested in some collaboration yeah. with IMRS, 
which um, is a really healthy sign at this stage. But I think what's important is that we know what what sort of dimension we are going to lead lead on. Um, so that's my thought at the moment, and and I would you know encourage anybody that's got other thoughts if if they would like to feed them into the institute to the technical department, it would help us um, perhaps move forward on this. Yeah. To form a special interest group, possibly with corresponding members, uh, is another idea that's going around in my mind. Um, thank you very much for inspiring the thought in this evening's lecture. But I, I, I would just say to that, um, the, the systemic approach I think is the right thing. And, and we all think that if you have our instinctive right, autonomous ship, that means loss of all these jobs and things. It won't be, because you'll have to think about how you control these things autonomously. So what's the training of those people who might be sitting a thousand miles away trying to solve an anti-collision problem somewhere out at sea? Um, the, the point around the engineers sniffing the engines and feeling the heat and all the rest of it, which of course we were all brought up with, weren't we? You know, leaking the steam and all the rest of it. But actually, the guys, when Richard goes to Mars, is he going to be touching the engines of the space capsule? It's not, is he? He's going to be controlling it and he'd be doing something completely different. And that's the, but I, I don't know the answer to this. I just know that it's an area we've got to look at. And it's the system that goes around it, as, as you say, John, which, which we can contribute to. Uh, the humans are going to be in it for a while. And, and autonomous operations are going to grow exactly the same way as digital navigation grew, exactly the same way as automatic operations grew. And there's a whole growing pain that goes on during that time. And people have got to be trained to do that, I think. But of course, that means money. You're still going strong, you must. Yeah, you must. One more question, and we carry on here. Uh, Adam, so you, you've talked uh, at length about, uh, to me, digital natives' ability or lack of ability to, or shortcomings in, in operating their generation's technology. There's a lot of elderly equipment out there, a lot of equipment that's mid-life but due to last even longer, you know, carriers which we're producing to last 50 years. Do you worry about, or have you considered, have, have your thoughts on their ability to, to manage and work the older stuff as well as the, uh, the yeah, contemporary? That's a, that's a really good question. Please don't, um, please don't take this digital native, digital immigrants thing too seriously. Um, it's just trying to, to, to make people think about what, what it means. But the, what you're touching on is this business, business of system knowledge, understanding how your system works. And, and that's something that I think we should all be thinking about. We should all, and it should be something that's within our training. Um, you know, if, if I go back to my time as a warfare officer, we understood what was called the, uh, the, the envelope, the capability of a missile system to really quite a serious degree. And we used to experiment with it. So what, what can you do? What's the limits of what you can do with that system and understand it? I would argue that in some cases, like the Royal Majesty case, um, those guys on that bridge, the report said they'd never seen a GPS failure in three years. And therefore, when it happened, they didn't spot it. And it's a bit like the, the Google car, isn't it? How do you spot that something got gone wrong? So what you've got to have is that inquiring mind. And that's what most engineers have, isn't it? Most engineers and scientists don't believe a bloody thing you say to them. They're going to go away and they're going to check and check and check. And most users won't believe a word the engineer says to them, make them go away and check and check and check. And, and it's that, that um, situation, that, that's what you want your operators to be, in, intelligently inquisitive about the systems they're operating and constantly checking against other things. So the, that, that inquisitive approach, do I really believe what it's told me? I'm looking out of the window, it doesn't look quite right. And, and, and I'm, uh, there is a worry in here, you know, is, is there a tipping point where that, that sort of cultural approach will just stop? Because people will believe everything they see. But then maybe there's something else they've got to worry about that none of us have thought of. So it wasn't a very good answer, but I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many of you came expecting quite such a magnificent lecture as we've had, but uh, I was very surprised and impressed and uh, very glad I was here. So, Admiral Lambert, thank you very much. You've done my father's memory proud and I'm very grateful for that. 
After this comes an opportunity to drink some wine, and that's just as important as what you just heard, so make full benefit of that as well. I believe the wine is served in the room just out there. It's a very posh, important room, so please don't spill it. <laughs> and one final round of thanks to Admiral Lambert for his most excellent lecture. Thank you very much.